This is Duke University. Today on a special issue of Left of Black, we examine the issue of everyday racism and everyday homophobia. We'll be joined by Professor Catherine Bond Stockton, Professor J. Jack Halberstam, Professor Marlon Ross, and Professor Sharon Patricia Holland. My name is Mark Anthony Neal, and this is Left of Black. Yeah. You're a real life for this one. <laughs> yeah. Most of this is going to be about those of you in the audience who, who have some questions. But there was an interesting backstory, um, back channel, if you will, um, during the course of the conversation. The wonderful thing about Twitter, we're having our conversation here, and there's seven other conversations taking place, <laughs> riffing off of it. Um, and there was a communications PhD student in Oregon um, who chimed in more than a few times, particularly around uh, Jack's uh, talk around anarchism and anarchy. Um, and he used very deliberate language, privileged scholars. <laughs> um, and to think about how do you frame yourself in this space, right, which is a very privileged space, and whether or not we want to own up to it or not, we're privileged scholars. Mm -hmm. Talking about everyday racism and everyday homophobia. Um, and Sharon gets a little bit at that, right, where we can't tell our stories mm -hmm. because there's no public discourse <laughs> to accept the context for our mm -hmm. stories. So what kind of work then w do we do beyond mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the theorizing? <laughs> Right, to really have meaningful conversation and meaningful impact around everyday racism and everyday homophobia. And of course, that doesn't necessarily mean voting the same guy back into office. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Do you want to stop that? Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's a great comment. And you know, it's almost obligatory to acknowledge the privilege of the position that allows you to speak and sit and think and write. and spend your day coming up with formulations. But what, one of the things that I heard on this panel that would be the, uh, the answer to that question is to think not simply in terms of harm and injury, but in terms of complicity. Mm -hmm. You heard it, there was a lot about complicity in these papers because I don't think that anyone understands themselves here as simply the most egregious victim of everyday racism and everyday homophobia, but there was a constant injunction in each presentation to think about how you become a vector for the thing that you might also be mm -hmm. um, uh, calling attention to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, that feels like, uh, to me, that's one of the, the undercurrents in Sharon's book that I take most seriously, and that she then drew out of Catherine's presentation in terms of not being satisfied with redemption as an answer, because redemption holds on to the same arrangements that were always there, but you know, basically makes apologies and makes everyone feel better. Mm -hmm. So there's no desire here to make anyone feel better or to speak from the place of the most injured. I think the, the challenge here is to try to think about uh, multiple complicities mm -hmm. in what Sharon's calling everyday racism. If they're everyday, then they're here. That was, that was what I just heard. <coughs> Marla? Um, I, think, I think I would emphasize Jack's last comment, because of what I was thinking is um, everyday racism and everyday homophobia, um, the, the thing about everyday is that it's everywhere. Right. That mm -hmm. academia is not outside, privilege itself is not outside of the everyday. In, fa in fact, it helps to fundamentally constitute the everyday. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And um, I think that um, there's no denying that we are protected, as we as academics are protected in particular ways that um, the people the subjects we've been talking about in these papers are not protected. And, you know, I think of the bottom and the economic bottom. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I, I, I think I think we're I, I think to dis I think that it's true that nobody is totally disconnected from everybody else, and that's not utopian. It's a fact. 
And you know, I think about when I think about experience of people who are I'm intimate with, who are constantly experiencing everyday racism and everyday homophobia in ways that um, I cannot exclude myself from. I want to say two things. I mean, obviously teaching, you know, is a part of this. We're at a university, and if we do take seriously, and certainly for me, I'm teaching often many, many white students, uh, rather class diverse, so I think we need to take mm -hmm. that seriously too. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously students who end up at a university are privileged in some ways, but I think, you know, at state universities in particular, it's sort of remarkable the class range of people that you're seeing. I mean, people who literally don't have facility at the level of the signifier, at least, you know, where I teach, you know, where there's still students learning to craft sentences. So it seems to me that, you know, among ourselves, we are diagnosing problems at a very sophisticated level, but part of what we are trying to do, this is why for me seduction is so key, yeah. is trying to attract people to these problems, to care about these problems, to want to delve deeper into problems. And so that gets into all the different things that we do, and I really do believe that the classroom is the scene of that seduction. The other thing I would say about this, and this is sort of where, for me, my new work is going, it's about queer praxis. And the question is, you know, at what point are we really going to sort of call ourselves to order to try to craft um, a, a way of living? And this is what I love about you actually sort of going in the direction of the personal. Mm -hmm. Totally agree with Jack that obviously these things are going to have to have solutions at much you know, more collective uh, structural levels, but are we just letting ourselves off the hook day after day, which is to say, what we're doing, we're just gonna keep diagnosing the problem and dissecting and slicing and dicing and so forth. And, you know, at, at what point are we gonna say, might we need to have a personal ethic? You know, I mean, as, if we're gonna wait for things to change, we'll be, we're basically letting ourselves off the hook and saying, we're waiting essentially for nothing to happen. I mean, if it really comes down to the question of poverty, we're just gonna, we're happy then just to wait for nothing to happen. So at what point might we craft an ethic that is on the one hand personal and could be collective? I mean, queers and black people and black queers have been so brilliant at times of sort of getting new representational ideas about ways of living out into the space. I mean, just look at the period of AIDS, how that really made it possible to sort of talk about promiscuity in a positive way, to have safe promiscuity was sort of a discourse that came out of AIDS. Why can't we take the lead, you know, as people of color, queer people of color, um, why can't we take the lead in saying that we're tired of waiting, you know, for the institutions that be to start addressing poverty, and that among ourselves, we are actually trying to imagine what a personal ethic would look like and to call our students, attract our students to that question. That, that's something I'm wondering about for myself. I have no idea if that's just headed towards a big brick wall. But um, I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of giving myself the opportunity to wait for essentially nothing. Well, my colleagues have answered brilliantly here, but I will add something. I think that when I first came across, um, you know, there's a term, the ba being a baby dyke. When I was a baby theorist, I first came across <laughs> critical race theory, and um, the term racism is ordinary. And I got so mad, right? And for years, I was like, I don't know about that theory. I don't know about it. And then I started to live my professional life. And the ordinary became something extraordinary in so many amazing ways, right? an encounter with a student who challenges you to make the connections. Well, what actually in feminism is important to critical race theory? And what actually in queer theory is important from critical race theory? And realizing I didn't have the perfect answer to those questions, which is pretty much where the book began. Um, and also I think you know this issue of um, how and I do believe that how are we going to affect change elsewhere if we cannot f affect change where we sit right um, if we cannot give voice even if that voice is misunderstood to me that's part of the process mm -hmm. part of the process is you're going to go in there you're going to say what you have to say and there's going to be a hell of a backlash to deal with yeah. but I just feel that that's what the process is about and I think one of the things I do in the book that I really talk, I talk to um, students in um, Professor Ryan Snyder's class yesterday, and um, I really wanted to focus on loss, right? That we lose something when we challenge, 
but sometimes we also gain something. And I hear people all the time saying, I don't want to do that because it might cause this. Right? And so what did I wanted to do by thinking about racism as ordinary was to rethink the logic of I don't want to do because it might cause. Yeah. Because then I was thinking of racism always already as spectacular. You know, that thing that might come out to get me that I could avoid. <laughs> when quite frankly, you know, you can't even go to the grocery store, right? right? You can't even stand online to vote. Right? Without somebody having, you know, and you know when it's coming your way, you're like, oh boy, please, please just stop. I just really want to be a girl handing in some shoes to be repaired. Or I really want to be a person picking up like a gallon of milk just to go home to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer, right? <laughs> right? And so I wanted to really think that moment really think that moment and think about how my, my, idea, my idea of racism was always already the spectacular that I was always trying to avoid. The, the scene that you talk about at the beginning of the book um, with your niece <laughs> um, and the interaction with the white woman, it, 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 it angles to this point that you just made that in, in many ways our responses are already rehearsed. Mm -hmm. because there's always an expectation. Exactly. Right? And so we just rehearse what our responses are going to be and, and the levels to which that response is going to be because of the everydayness of it, right? Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, that scene, yeah, that, that scene was one of the first scenes where, you know, I was like, oh, wow, I actually had a response. Yeah. Because usually you just look like, please go away, right? But those responses in some ways make our responses then become staged and spectacular in and of themselves. Absolutely. Because of it. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to open this up to the audience. Um, make sure to use the mic and feel free to introduce yourself. <laughs> yes. It's on. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Williams Pies, and I'm visiting from Southern California. Uh, I teach at a prestigious community college in Santa Clarita Valley, also known as Pleasantville. And uh, I, I very much appreciate the panel and, and what this uh, organization is doing today. Um, I'll definitely be reading all your books, but I wanted to uh, talk about uh, this notion of betweenness and space uh, mm -hmm. because I think it answers the question that. Uh, Mr. Neal posed in terms of how do we bridge that gap between our privilege as academics, as teachers, and what's going on with our students. Uh, 70 to 80 percent of our students come into my classroom not knowing how to read or write above a seventh grade level. And I know that you experience that at the four-year schools too, because somehow these things are perpetuated uh, systemically and otherwise. And um, I think uh, what, what I hear people saying, and maybe there's some comment, I don't know if there's a question in here, but there, the process is just as important, I'm finding, as the end result. Uh, the, not only the content of the message, but those students having an aha moment, those students asking questions they might not have posed before. And the space, the, the thing about space in a metaphysical or, or a physical sense <coughs> is there is no empty space. And um, there's always activity, there's always movement in space, and so there's that uh, room for reflection and, um, or for uh, getting mad at the professor or for reacting or for having that aha moment. And I'm wondering if someone uh, can speak. I know uh, uh, Professor Stockton, you spoke of um, the, the space between blackness and queerness. And, is there a way we can think about that in a dialectic or a pedagogical framework like Freire's work that, that speaks to a lot of activity, that that, that process of um, disseminating very important ideas and giving students the opportunity for their voice is also something that's productive, um, not, not in a utilitarian way, but in an existential and uh, liberating way. Maybe I'll just say a word about that because this li actually mm -hmm. links to something um, that I think is, is very profound in what Sharon's trying to do in her book. So the whole question of experience, you know, that you sort of brought us back to mm -hmm. the phenomenological. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if you really take Derrida seriously on the one hand and Sharon Holland on the other, you'll be sort of <laughs> led to this point, which is, 
you know, signifiers on the one hand have established meanings, right, that are attached to them. They have denotations and then they have connotations that are attached to them. But they also have affects, you know, that stick to them. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the really complicated, difficult, interesting things to talk about. But that is literally, you know, if Sharon says black, there are all kinds of affect that stick to that, right? We might have the same denotative meanings from the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And actually, maybe in this point in time, being scholars who work cross, you know, read each other, we might even have similar connotative fields that surround them. Mm -hmm. But I'm sort of guessing that the affective surround just of certain signifiers could be profoundly different for us. And then, of course, the experiences we've had with the signifiers are different for us. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's something that I think we're trying to get to. And I was so intrigued and moved that in Sharon's book, you know, she is sticking to the idea that, of course, you need the three signifiers, black, queer, female, right? So even there, just to even point to this this thing, um, this vibrant being, you have to have three different words. So right there, the three different words are having to go into some sort of chemical equation with each other. <laughs> you know, so that's happening on a theoretical level. And then in our classroom, and this is what I mean, we are packing affect around the signifier. So in mm -hmm. addition to sort of bringing students into the scene of hopefully greater canniness, you know, at the level of the signifier, so much affect is packed around the signifier that I think that's a tremendous labor that teaching is doing, um, that we just so somehow don't seem to attend to enough. And that's, I think, where maybe more thought has to go into it and where I think the way that Sharon's using the notion of the experience, experiential is very telling and, and very profound and doesn't reduce to the idea of personal something or other is really about you know, the unique affective surround of signifiers that we each have, and then it crosses into public domain and shared space. And mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. there. And I would add to that, it, and is not read all that differently inside the academy than outside the academy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Twitter, and it's for you, Sharon, um, from Alexis Gums. <laughs> hey, Alexis. Um, who wanted you to talk a little bit more about the idea of letting black feminism mm. go all together. Mm. And that was, that was meant as a pr provocation. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and she, she did put a little smiley. A smiley face? <laughs> after, okay. after the question. I'll hit you up on Facebook <laughs> later about that, right? Um, thanks so much for the, the question. Um, I want, I put the question out there because as soon as you do, it makes people think about what black feminism is. And without saying let's lose it, you can't actually have the next conversation about what it is, what it does, how it marks and moves certain aspects of our theorizing. And then as we move through it or with it or because of it, we in a sense lose the very body that it's supposed to in a sense represent. And so, Again, I say it as a, as a provocation, but what I mean by it is that once we question what black feminism is, then we ask ourselves, actually, how is the work of Patricia Hill Collins relevant to what I'm doing or not relevant? How is the work of Jennifer Nash relevant to what I'm doing or not relevant? And also just be okay when it's not, right? Um, how is the work of Audre Lorde? I mean, I directly contradict something I wrote about Audre Lorde um, in an earlier essay, you know, on um, the difference between the, porno the pornographic and the erotic. I was very excited about that in, in my, you know, you know um, baby theorist days. And when I began to really think through the work of the erotic, I began to see that perhaps that distinction might have led us in the wrong direction. And we might want to pick apart that distinction just a little bit, which honors her, honors her contribution by saying, I'm still thinking about this. I might think very differently about this over time, but I still want to be in conversation with you because you're important to the work I have to do in order to get from here to there. And maybe in 10 years' time, I'll go back and say I was absolutely wrong in ELR, <laughs> and now I want to say that Audra's right and for the following reasons. I, I mean, it's a question that's posed, for instance, by the Crunk Feminist cr Collective, mm -hmm. you know, on a regular basis. You know, what does black feminism look like? for a generation of under 30-somethings, mm -hmm. you know, who are millennials, um, who are embedded in popular culture, um, in which the kind of standard bearers of black feminism don't, are not usable, exactly. or, or don't provide a kind of utility for doing that kind of mm -hmm. work. Um, and I think also in, you know, I think Charlotte Ammon's um, um, theory about the Bentley mode right. really fits in there. I mean, you can go back in time 
you know, yeah, to, you know, um, think about a, a somebody who might not consider themselves a feminist, but you know, to um, think about her as a feminist um, icon, icon yeah. and then bring bring that 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 voice forward, but bring it forward not in what she represents, right? What Gladys Bentley represents, but bring it forward in terms of the problematic yeah. that Bentley addresses through performance. And I think that that kind of new work is really intriguing to me. For those who aren't familiar, Gladys Bentley was a Harlem Renaissance mm -hmm. era black queer performer who performed female masculinity. Um, mm -hmm. And Charlotte Ammons, who's a local Durham-based artist, has just done a recording called Twilight for Gladys Bentley, mm -hmm. in which she talks about this idea of Bentley mode. She's theorizing, right? Mm -hmm. Outside of the Absolutely. academy. Absolutely. Right? She's theorizing about... She has a little caveat, about, like all right. you academics don't hate on me for this, right? <laughs> she's theorizing about what she calls Bentley mode, which is black against blackness, queer against queerness. Mm -hmm. You know, really an interesting kind of challenge to these positions that we, we, mm -hmm. we hold on to, right? And it gets to that point that's not something that we would have found necessarily in traditional black feminist writing at this point in time, right? It's happening elsewhere. We have a question here. Uh, I'm Cheryl Scrimpture, working right now on putting a preschool in a nursing home, I hope, or assisted living center. But um, I, I'm going to comment on too much talking and not enough talking. I, I spent way too much time in school. <laughs> and I have to confess at a certain point this afternoon, I just wanted to walk out because kind of a weariness of mm -hmm. all the talking and all this, you know, the verbal images and so on. But my question is, and I have a story to go with this, have you thought or have you had the experience of having this conversation in churches? And the story is that I'm a member of a radical Baptist church in Chapel Hill and just chaired an ordination committee for... Uh, wh where is it? Can you tell us where we can go? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're certainly in need of more radical Baptist churches. Yeah, yeah. I won't give you the address. I'm probably getting in trouble right <laughs> But uh, anyway, the ordination um, candidate was this brilliant young black man who studied at Howard and came to our church because he wanted to be with highly educated clergy and thought that our statement of wel welcoming and affirming um, that is actually kind of a code word for gays and lesbians actually meant welcoming and affirming for everybody. Yeah. Um, so he did very well in the ordination uh, process. The American Baptist churches voted to ordain him. When he got to our committee, the ordination council voted to ordain him with, the, with one gay member abstaining. And when it got to the church in conference with all the members of the churches, mm -hmm. hell broke loose. Um, and he finally withdrew his ordination request at the church. Um, so that's my question is, can you imagine having this conversation in a local church? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I should say he was from a Pentecostal background. So uh, the, the thing, I, I forgot to say that his statement that turned everything around was saying that I would have asked that when it last happened. Uh, and, and please preface your response by letting us know the last time any of you have actually been in a church. <laughs> <laughs> I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can start or does anyone else want to? Um, thanks. thanks. Uh, all right, I got last your back. I'm right behind you. Got, you got, you got, you got me. Um, actually, I was in church very recently over the Amendment One um, <laughs> issue, and um, I think of the church as the woods, and I have a lot of folks on my road, and I have a, a a very good friend now, who is what I call a road or driveway friend. You know, the kind of friend that you're really intimate with, but you never really been in each other's houses. You just talk on the street for like an hour, and um, so we've actually made had a discussion in the post Amendment One. Um, um, North Carolina to try to get together to bring some of this discussion to the churches, the local churches, particularly maybe her church or you know surrounding. So I think, but I also think this discussion was already started long before Amendment One in churches, and Amendment One just ratcheted up people's you know you know. So I know a lot of people on you know quality and inequality now, um, leaders in that particular movement, grass community organizers who went to churches all the time and who were, of course, members of churches and challenge, you know, are always challenging people to think differently. And change is coming. 
we can see that. The same kind of discourse that, that ran elections before 2008 is not gonna work anymore. Not in the same way, I'm not being utopic here. But you know, something happened in this election and mm -hmm. people are taking note of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much I could say about that. I mean, I live in Utah, so I live right in a state where the church is dominant, and 50%, probably about 50% of my students at my university are fairly strongly identified uh, with the church. Um, so I end up with a lot of students with religious thinking um, in my classes. I teach both courses that draw people specifically, but also sort of open range courses. And it's very important for me to say, to my students at least, tell me what you think. You cannot offend me. It goes back to what Sharon's saying. I, why should I be afraid that they have some view, you know, that just radically conflicts with my own or have a set of views that I would find really kind of, you know, odious on some level? I want to hear what people are thinking. I don't want them to self-censor in the classroom. And I think I have a strong feeling every one of us on this panel, we go out into the community all the time, you know, speaking to statewide pediatricians, speaking to social workers, speaking to clinicians. Um, and I think all the ideas that we talked about here, we can easily translate, you know, into a setting where we're talking with people um, in, in a different way, using different language, you know, speaking at uh, shorter length. Um, so all of these ideas are very possible to bring to folks at, at any level, and if they aren't, that's a problem. So in other words, I think we want to challenge ourselves constantly to be able to speak to lots of different settings, and I think that happens. I think people who are politically engaged in their work take that very seriously, and therefore churches are part of that, and the understanding in the classroom that we have students with deeply held religious beliefs, and I want to hear what they have to say, so that I can at least sort of make my case, you know, I can speak back to that. But I think there has to be connection to do that, Weirdly, at least in my environment, you have to have warmth. If you show warmth and connection mm -hmm. and curiosity about what somebody else thinks, even if an arrow is aimed at your head, you know, you have an opportunity um, to present a signifier. So I, I do take that very seriously. Thanks for the question. Um, the last time I was in church was last week. I went to a Black Voices concert. Black Voices is a long-standing tradition at Virginia. It is the Christian ministry, evangelical ministry of African-American students at the University of Virginia. Uh, it's one of the most popular organizations on campus. My students were, um, uh, at the end of the concert, um, a minister from um, the uh, First Black Baptist Church of Charlottesville, which is a hi very historical African-American church, um, made the appeal for sinners um, uh, for about six, seven minutes. I felt very uncomfortable. <laughs> but um, uh, m s my students were in the choir and they were in the audience and I was there to support my students. What's interesting to me is that the same students on the podium, um, in the choir, uh, very much in sync with the call for sinners to come down and be saved are the same students who sit in my classroom while I'm teaching Marlon Riggs or while I'm teaching Sweet Sweet Bad Sweet Sweet Back's Badass That's Song, so. and they respond sometimes with nervousness, but they listen carefully. Mm -hmm. They listen carefully, and they have a notion of sin in their head sometimes. Though I've noticed in the ten years I've been at Virginia, that notion of sin is changing dramatically. <laughs> they have a notion of sin in their heads, and they are struggling with the fact. Most of them know I'm queer. They're struggling with that, but they love me. <laughs> and they respond to me, and they love the material. And you know, I always, in my black protest narrative class with, um, with uh, a section on queer, um, queer protest where I teach Audre Lorde, and I teach um, uh, the Marlon Riggs films and some other things. And I, at this point, they have absolutely no problem with it. And maybe it's because it's generational, um, so I think they go into those churches and they can hear sometimes even a preacher teaching homosexuality is a sin, but I'm not sure that the connotations that lock onto it in the past are necessarily locking onto it. I'm not sure it has the same resonance. Mm -hmm. So I feel as though, given how religious some of, many of my students are, I feel as though I teach in church every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I don't go into churches, and I recognize that for some people, this is a really meaningful space. Then in African American protest history, this is a really important space. So I don't mean to knock the church out of hand, but obviously I'm drawn <laughs> to the idea of a kind of spiritual force that is outside of the church. No church in the wild wow. yeah. um, is the name <coughs> of uh, my talk, precisely because I hear people wanting to find ways to articulate revolt separate from institutional forms. And the church is an institutional form, it is. Even if it has great meaning for you personally, ritualistically, which is great, it still is an institutional form within which there are appropriate ways of expressing yourself and inappropriate ways have already been suppressed. So um, recent, just, just in the press yesterday was um, Angela Merkel, the um, pre the Prime Minister in Germany um, has been taken to task for saying that Christianity is the most persecu persecuted religion in the world, which is really rich coming from a German um, <laughs> leader. I think probably, probably anti-Semitism, yeah. Judaism has a little bit more purchase on that in Germany. Um, <laughs> okay, but the, but the language that we're resisting, notice, is religious language, redemption. Redemption is yeah. a Christian idea. It's a Christian idea that if one person makes a sacrifice, mm -hmm. other people will be saved, which is a lovely idea, but you often, particularly in this country, particularly in terms of right-wing white Christianity, you don't see a lot of these values really being played out. You actually see them as a cover for the most outrageous forms of dispossession yeah. and, um, uh, you know, uh, consolidation of class relations. So um, that I, I really want to hold on to some of the sentiment in No Church in the Wild that outside of some of these structures that we inhabit, there are other forms of being, belonging, believing that don't need that institution in order to circulate. <laughs> Thank you. You can come to my church anytime. We need some help. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Hi, I'm Mark Rifkin. I teach at uh, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Uh, and I wanted to pick up on um, elements of uh, Jack's talk, sort of thinking through Marlon's talk on the way to a question for Sharon that you know, anyone else can also feel free to pick up. But specifically the question of solidarity and the potential limits of the black-white binary kind of as a frame. And Marlon talking about um, homology and these sort of complicated genealogies, which are not, which are not lineage, nor are they analogy, right? But they, they uh, share historical relations and can be understood as coming from sort of similar places, but they're not equivalent, right? So uh, I understand the, the erotic life of racism. The part of the project is, as you were articulating earlier, Sharon, um, to disaggregate right, um, uh, black feminism, black lesbian, right, as a, a sort of self-identical sign, right, and to think about um, instantiations of uh, particular everyday interactions or in the theoretical realm, particular right, theorists, so it's not this kind of homogenous unity, okay. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and to think about then the, um, uh, the sort of sensuous, uncommented upon obviousness of uh, quotidian modes of oppression and the affects that go with them. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about to what extent does that project, even in, in relation to thinking about uh, uh, the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and contemporary instantiations mm -hmm. of blackness, does that project to think about the everyday have to be, uh, uh, is it opened by uh, an insistence on the black-white binary, right, as a critical frame, especially as you've noted, you know, I, I believe here, but certainly in the book, your own long-standing commitments, right, and mm -hmm. quite fulsome mm -hmm. commitments to uh, Native studies, mm -hmm. right, uh, and uh, especially the ways that the critique of transnationalism, the critique you offer of transnationalism, mm -hmm. I think uh, it, it certainly seems to me to, uh, in part, be animated by Native studies critique of transnationalism. I believe in the book you right. actually sort of footnote it to right. that, so you mm -hmm. explicitly kind of note your own intellectual genealogy. Mm -hmm. So thinking again in that, that sort of possibility of solidarity, these kinds of homologies, mm -hmm. Uh, so is the black-white binary necessary here? Uh, that's one question. Then the other question is, kind of how do we think these issues in relation to right, histories of settlement, especially when, Sharon, I think you were talking about what does it mean to sit in this space, right? that as a quotidian experience, but also as a space of settlement, as occupied mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. right? so, so again, specifically to you, but if anyone else would like to 
sort of comment on that, especially the question of is the black-white binary necessary to the kind of work that you're, uh, the incredibly important work that you're doing uh, in the book? Um, I guess what I'd like to unpack is, you know, I guess um, define black, white, define necessary, mm -hmm. right? So I'm going to think about it both materially and kind of psychically. And so the answer to your question is yes on both accounts, right? Because what I'm really pointing toward is the fact that we've, we have unfinished work there, right? That, you know, um, and an, I'm, I'm thinking of something in particular that comes out of... Um, different um, circumlantic ideas in critical race theory, right? Um, usually what the thing that attaches itself to black theorists working on race in this country is that we understand race as something white people do to black people. Mm -hmm. And that's been interpreted for us by critical race theorists, right? And the kind of more expansive version of that would be racism, racism and race you know, is about power, right? And so instead of thinking about the 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 relationship, the black-white binary, as necessary or unnecessary to us, I really wanted to just investigate its work. And at each point in time in the book, it does different work. And I said, if it's doing all of this work for us, then we obviously need it for something, right? And so I think that was pretty much um, where I was going with that critique, to try to map, right? And I was also very interested at precisely the moment that folks wanted to move away from the kind of more parochial definition of what racism is, all of the examples in the books, you know, okay, 90% of them, came back to examples of black-white entanglement, right, in some way, shape, or form. And I found that really odd, and that's when I got to the question of what kind of work is this, that example doing for us? And how white might we begin to, I use something from Tavia, you know, to defrost that single dialectic, just defrost it. Not trying to like really, you know, cook it for dinner. You know, I'm just trying to like, you know, get it so that maybe I can work with it a little bit. So I think what I'm in, interested in in the book is fungibility and how, and to catch us every time we employ it or every time it's an example. Because then what happens when it's an example, then, you know, I mean, a, a perfect example, I was telling my students um, the other day and, and I, I see a few of them in the room. Thanks for coming out. and. Um, I was telling them that, you know, I, I, I get papers where people will begin the paper by saying, you know, the black woman has been oppressed throughout time. Mm -hmm. right? And you just really don't know how to, like, break that down, you know, <laughs> without, like, hurting somebody's feelings, right? And so you want to say, okay, you know, so the first thing I say before they write, please don't say that. <laughs> you know, just, right. just don't go there, right? Let's think of other ways in which we can make that point, but also bring some humanity to the black body bring a little pleasure and a little pain, right? And so I think the black-white also is frozen in that single awful, right? And we don't really think about the orgasm that produced most of us in this country in the first place. <laughs> Whether that orgasm was you know, qualitatively consensual or not. Right? So that I wanted to think kind of the radical outside of that, of that meeting. So that's, you know, I, I'm not sure if that was the material and the, but. Um, I think it's worth saying that this opposition between queer diaspora and um, queer indigeneity has been unnecessarily stabilized. And the, yeah, there's an issue of GLQ where one, particularly the introduction, uh, um, queer indigeneity, I think it's called, is it? I wrote the afterword for that. Yeah, you wrote yeah. the afterword. I mean, one, the, it, it doesn't seem to me that one needs to say we have too quickly moved to diaspora in order to say we should be theorizing the relationship uh, um, among, the relationships among race, belonging, hate, and love mm -hmm. in relationship to native populations as well. These are not mu mutually exclusive, but they are being theorized as such. There's a, a real desire to theorize settler colonialism right now um, for all kinds of great reasons, uh, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't, settler colonialism isn't coexistent with other forms of colonialism that send peoples out into the world, um, that force them then to come back to the metropole, and so on. All of these movements, migration, immigrations, um, forced migrations have to be thought about together against the population that is forever theorized as stuck in place. Yeah. You know, so it's that 
mobility stasis binary also that needs to be really heavily worked through. And I, 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 I mean, I feel like Sharon is, you know, unpacking it for us, and now we need to push on and break that opposition. We're going to take one more question, which fittingly will be from Mr. Solomon Burdett. <laughs> Seats. The running joke being, of course, that you can't have an event here at the Franklin Center without Solomon Burdett asking a question. <laughs> I've been incognito as of late. And I actually have two questions in my head. You know, um, President's speech last night, um, well, a couple nights ago, seems so long now. Um, I, I just wanted to bring up Puar and terrorist assemblages. Um, I feel almost like um, there's a new war that started in Africa with the deposition of Gaddafi and the Benghazi bombings. And um, I guess Puar brings up, you know, um, ideas of homo nationalism um, and how you know the radical left has been silent um, regarding certain issues of international import. And I guess, um, how do we have a conversation um, around homo nationalism in queerer times, as um, you know, Poor brings up in terrorist assemblages? I guess um, my second thing is, um, I, um, I, I find conversations around you know um, being born this way versus moralism to be somewhat passe. But I've witnessed situations in which. Um, People were sexually traumatized. Um, and within, when I think of racism and homophobia every day, I think of the prison industrial complex and situations where people are traumatized in particular ways um, and then um, you know, uh, take on queer expressions, um, uh, some would say as a coping mechanism. And so as we talk about queerness and life and death, can we have a conversation around um, trauma and queerness and coercion and it seems kind of out of it to say how do we theorize about it but I guess how do we address it you know if we're going to be talking about you know from the bottom also I, can I ask you to repeat what's the question about mo homo nationalism or what's the comment I'm just trying to understand well, well um, I was thinking about um, terrorist assemblages. Um, I guess looking at um, different ways in which um, now, uh, where previously different ideas of um, uh, queerness had been associated with death um, in American society, and now as they're being inscripted legally into part and parcel of you know American Republican legal code, I guess you know they're being associated with ideas of life simultaneous we simultaneous with the excription of, of former groups, of groups um, out of our conception of what is life and death, particularly South Asians, Arabs, Africans now, um, with regards to in um, relation to September 11th, the war on terror and things. Uh, to the first question about terrorist assemblages, uh, I'm very f frightened with the new scramble for Africa that's occurring and the role that uh, sexuality is playing in that scramble. Mm -hmm. And I really, ha I don't have anything substantive to say except that there's a lot of work to be done at a very basic level about um, the new AFRICOM, that is the United States, uh, creating a new military intelligence uh, security uh, 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 headquarters within Africa and how that's related to, I, I don't want to sound cons conspiratorial here, but how that's related to what is happening in the relationship between um, white evangelical churches and churches uh, and evangelicalism in Africa, um, it's, um, in, pl in some pla a place like Uganda. Um, that there's a, there's a lot going on that, I, that even with Ian Puar's work, I don't think it's being addressed. Um, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure her theory fully um, provides a way into the really insidious things that are happening. Uh, and I would just add one more dimension to it, what's going on in, in, in um, many African countries in relation to China. Um, that there is also a whole 
um, realm of sexuality involved in that that I don't think people are th thinking about, and I don't know how to think about it. Um, to your um, second, I forgot, your second question was about... Um, Trauma. Prison. Trauma. Oh, yeah, I, I think that's really important. And years ago when I was uh, doing... Um, Manning the race, and you know, now hopefully, finally finishing the second volume. Um, people have been urging me to talk about this, and finally, I've gotten around to it, but I got around to it in a strange way um, because the last chapter of uh, Color of Manhood is focused on uh, black queer, popular black queer romance, and a lot of uh, the romance novels written being written by um, black uh, queer men. A, a lot of the romances are prison romances, talking about prison homosexuality. And they talk about it in such complex, baffling ways that are really instructive. Because uh, on one page is uh, rape and coercion. On the next page, and a dis disidentification with, with gayness. On the next page is an affirmation of the sex that's occurring but the same characters. Mm -hmm. It is really complex, and mm -hmm. I, all I can say is I'm trying to think a little bit about it, but a lot more work needs to be done. I think it is really crucial given the demographic, the percentage of African-American men and men of color, and increasingly women of color and in prison and the kind of sexual, the sexuality that can and does and does not occur within those spaces. And the relationship between that and what happens in the communities as people go back and forth between incarceration and mm -hmm. the, the communities. Mm -hmm. You know, Tavio Nyong'o, maybe you know the title of that essay. It was on bully bloggers. I thought that was one of the very interesting things. He was writing in the wake of the Coney 2012 stuff, you know, when that was all kind of burning brightly as a flame. And, and Tavio came in and wrote a really incisive, interesting piece. Maybe it's on bully bloggers. He linked to an essay yeah. that he's published. And I think that would be a great place to start. I think it's yeah. a very intelligent sort of unpacking of the question of the evangelical interventions in Africa and so forth. So that would be yeah. uh, a piece to look up. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, Again, it, it seems to me that one doesn't have to let go of an earlier theoretical model in order to exactly. move on to something else. So the, the, what I was objecting to in Poir's work, it's not even in her work, uh, but it's more in the taking up of Poir's work is, oh yeah, let's use assemblage, Deleuzean assemblage, it's better than intersectionality, you know? And these are historically specific mm -hmm. formulations often mm -hmm. that are necessary to cover a wide range of different racial formations and impacts and effects that one wants to discuss. So for me, it's about, my critique of that work is about the, the, this paradigm where always one thing gives way to mm -hmm. the next almost completely mm -hmm. and there's nothing left. And I, 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 this is why I'm referring people to Chandan Reddy's work because in looking at the way in which the state secures freedom for some, using violence against others, he finds that intersectionality as a critical race paradigm embedded in the law is indispensable. He can't move on to assemblage because assemblage is a little bit too fuzzy about who is positioned where in relationship to what, historically speaking. Now, here's the thing. That's where Sharon's work comes in, which is why I found the alliance odd in there, even though there is a, a kind mm -hmm. of a critique of Poir, mm -hmm. because Sharon is actually saying, no, I can't quickly move now to this universalizing paradigm of the assemblage because I'm still trying to deal with the woman in the parking lot who thought that, that civil rights movements were what she got involved in to help yeah. black people, like as if you know, <laughs> uh, this was something she was doing out of the goodness of her heart when she says to mm -hmm. Sharon to think I march for you, and Sharon says, you didn't march for me, you marched for yourself. In other words, the outcome of white racism can't be ra white benevolence. Mm -hmm. You know, it can't be counted <laughs> by white benevolence. Oh, I'm sorry that I enslaved you for hundreds of years, but I did march for you last week, and this is how you repay me, you know. Mm -hmm. So you can't get there. You can't get at these uh, absolutely micro um, but crucial interactions, the white hand on the black arm, the black hand on the white arm, without the model that Sharon is giving us that is quickly swept away by running off to assemblage with its groovy sort of fractal uh, dynamics. And yeah. that's, that's what I was trying to 
mm -hmm. call attention to. Not that I'm not interested in homo nationalism. That's the complicity. Homo, all kinds of homo mm -hmm. formations are completely complicit with Im imperialism, neo-imperialism, settler colonialisms, military endeavors, and so on. But some of the micro features of racism have to be addressed in other language. And I mm -hmm. think that that's what Sharon's, Sharon's book gives us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think this all comes down to what you know, Catherine brought to forward today, and that's, um, that's redemption. Right? Because redemption is like, just kind of like I would call auto-replacement. Right. right. That something mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. And so loss is completely taken out of the picture. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you if you if you miss the opportunity for loss to account for it, to mark it, then you're always going to have this like false reciprocity. <laughs> you know, I did that for you and you should be grateful. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, if we've seen anything at Duke in the last week, that whole discourse of redemption, sans loss th and gratefulness in the affirmative action debate right, in the, in the chronicle here, right? We would definitely understand that those narratives are out there and they need to be, they need to be unpacked. You know, we can't move on, you know, this, 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 this paradigm is much better to talk about X. Mm -hmm. I think it's like, no, we're still actually using that old language, mm -hmm. pretty yeah. much yeah. all the time. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's why, to answer Mark's earlier question, the return to the black-white binary, mm -hmm. to really think about the work. I just want to thank you all, um, and, and mostly, you know, from your young perspectives uh, on what's going on, you know, because I have a 16, I know even though you all are not the youngest in the room, but Wait a minute. I have a 16 year old. I feel good now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad she's given us us for it. that talks like you all, um, that refuses to put everything in a box, and, um, that says, you know, feminism, black feminism, womanist, womanism, all that stuff has some good, but it also doesn't have so much good stuff. Mm. And so I don't want to be labeled there. Uh, last year, my daughter talked to me, and she says, you know, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm into anarchy, but I want to, I want to participate in politics. And, and my, mind, <laughs> my mind went crazy until I sit and, you know, I listen to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then your mm -hmm. whole piece about the analogies, you know, and how, and I said, you know, in my realm, I usually work in national faith um, context, and so multi-faith context. And so I'm always hearing people, you know, doing the analogy of the civil rights movement and, you know, freedom and rights for, for the LGBT community, and, and you, black person, how do you feel about that? Yeah. Um, right. And yeah. you, black Christian woman, and lesbian, yeah. how do you feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> I have the answer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I really like how you talked about moving away from the analogy mm -hmm. and, and being able to say, yes, there are some generational similarities, but one is not the same. And that's really important mm -hmm. for those of us in, ch in churches and synagogues and temples who are having mm -hmm. this, this conversation constantly mm -hmm. around racism and homophobia. Mm -hmm. And so letting us out of the box and you all saying mm -hmm. theories can run alongside each other and across each other, mm -hmm. and the box has gotten, gotten larger, is really where our young people are. And so you may wow. think that, you know, Thank you. because you're something, <laughs> 26. <laughs> but you are talking the right language for our next generation of young people mm -hmm. who are really uh, doing the analysis and the critical thinking about their world today. And so I, I thank God for all of you. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Thank but you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Eric, you're a real life Eric. G for this one. Yeah. All black everything, all black you know All black in the name of all my black heroes All black everything, all black polos All black medallions, yeah All black you know say All black everything, all black you know All black in the name of all my black heroes 